Before Hi. we kick off, I, I got to uh, let you know, I've, um, I've gotten a lot of people excited, messaged me and saw this conversation on LinkedIn and have messaged me uh, and said, whoa, you know, Betty, or, and like a lot of people from different, uh, like even like college friends. Um, so you seem like quite a, quite a celebrity yourself. I, I've really been looking forward to this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, for, to kick it off, um, I'll, I'll quickly introduce myself. So I'm Casey Saren. I am the founder and CEO at Spaceback and our platform helps brands uh, take take their social media content and, and investment in social media uh, and uh, recreate those experiences in, in ad units to power paid business, as we see like a lot of brands have their best content in social. Um, but today really wanted to uh, pick your brain as, a, as an expert in uh, in the influencer space and social media um, and, 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 you know, get, get more insight um, on, on ways that we can kind of see things moving forward. I know like we, we talked about in our kind of uh, uh, intro call that you know we're probably going to spend less time on pandemic uh you know stuff um and and focus more on like where things are going uh so um yeah but do you want to do you want to give a quick intro on on your role and what you're focused on yeah um so hi everyone i'm betty ann fialkov and i head up um, influencer partnerships and entertainment event experiences um, at lyft um, i've been at lyft for just over three years prior to that i was at google for a very long time um, and basically um, what my day-to-day -day is is working with all tiers of influencers and celebrities from micro influencers um, with you know, 10 to 200,000 followers on one platform to, you know, big um, tier A celebrities, household names um, to help really tell the story um, of Lyft and, you know, create content that tells a story. Um, and then on the event side, pre-COVID, um, we were doing um, a lot of event partnerships and sponsorships. So for example, um, we were the official rideshare partner um, for the past years at Sundance and the Emmys. And so I helped bring that strategy to life and help produce that. Awesome. And um, can you share with us, uh, you know, I, I haven't had too many celebrity encounters uh, myself, so um, it, it sounds like you've gotten to work, work with a lot of celebrities, uh, you know, big, big and small. Um, can you share with us just one of who's been one of your favorite celebrities to, to work with and why? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, and so I've worked with a lot of celebrities and people that are now celebrities, they weren't as big back then. But I have to say, um, I've worked with John Legend and his team twice now, once at Google, once at Lyft. And I just think um, he is one of the most um, amazing people to work with. He's so smart and um, charismatic and down to earth. And he's really surrounded himself with people that have his best interest in mind. And so, um, you know, he is is not a diva when you're working with him. Um, when I was at Google, we um, worked together on a, a music video that was shot entirely on Pixel 2. Um, and then at Lyft, um, we worked together around some of our voting initiatives, getting um, the formerly incarcerated communities, which he's very passionate about, um, to polling stations so that they could vote. Um, so I think, you know, he, he was, um, him and his team were a dream. Um, it doesn't always work that way. You know, I've um, worked with partners who, uh, you know, are contracted to do one thing, do something else, and then they're on a flight to China and they've posted something that goes totally against like what the campaign is supposed to be about and you can't get a hold of them and their management can't get a hold of them. And, you know, um, the thing that I always remember, though, in, in those cases, there it's few and far between the cases where it's been sort of a bad experience. But um, in those cases, you always have to remember, like, you're dealing with humans, like, it's not just a transaction, it's a human you're dealing with on the other end. Yeah, and I have to imagine, like, a lot of um, the, these celebrities have different approaches to this, where some are probably, you know, have, have, uh, want to have more creative input, where others are just kind of tell me what to do. But, you know, what what is the like the spectrum that you've dealt with, like what, what what's the best process or I should say, like for working with a celebrity, like how much do you want them to be involved in the creative process? Yeah, I definitely, you know, I think the, the, the best results that I've gotten from celebrity partnerships are when they are heavily involved with the process and we give them creative control of whatever it is. Like when it comes down to it, 
whether it's a small micro influencer or a big celebrity, you're going to this person for their creative genius, for, you know, their input. Like it long gone are the days of, you know, like here's a sponsorship, let's, you know, show our product and that's it. Like it's really about telling a story and we turn to these micro influencers to celebrities in order to help tell that story. And I want them to be able to authentically tell that story. And the only way that's possible is if they are really allowed to have creative input. Once you put these influencers and celebrities into a box and give them so many guidelines, then it kind of ruins, you know, that, that relationship. Um, when I was at Google, I did a lot of product partnerships where we, um, went to, you know, names like Skrillex, who was super popular at the time. This was like eight years ago. Um, Skrillex or Jeff Koons, the artist. And we had them create um, a physical product, um, which was phone cases at the time. And those products told a story and then we sold them on the Google store. And we didn't tell them what to create. They came up with, you know, everybody we worked with came up with the ideas of this is what the phone case should look like. This is a story it should tell. Had we at Google told them that it would defeat the purpose of the partnership. That's really cool. And actually gives me uh, more, more faith as a consumer um, that, that like these celebrities are actually, um, when they're putting their name on something, I, I imagine that they, I mean, the reason they're a celebrity in the first place is, you know, their, their creative process is respected and, you know, people look up to that in one way or another. So that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, and I have to imagine the celebrities, it's in their best interest to, uh, you know, for, for their own brand to, to be authentic uh, as well. So um, it, it's Definitely. great that the majority of your experiences sound like they, they've been positive. Yeah. And, and I mean, like to that point, there are a lot of um, celebrities that are getting involved with brands at, and, and getting involved um, as like a specific role within the brand. So they will be the, you know, lead creative director or they'll, um, I just saw something that um, uh, a big TikToker is now, um, leading up like TikTok partnerships at a brand, you know, they're, they're bringing these creators in house in order to, to help with that and really give them kind of like skin in the game. Yep. No, th this is, this is awesome. And I, I think, um, the really good segue into kind of talking about authenticity and, and that is like, uh, really, I think what makes influencer marketing, you know, so, so effective is it feels a lot more authentic than just a brand talking to you. Um, I do think like with, with that, there are risks over time with, as the, you know, the creator economy matures of like retaining that kind of authenticity. Um, it sounds like you're really mindful about that when you're working with celebrities, um, when you're working with like other kinds of influencers or, or even, um, influencers that have a smaller audience. So like, like you said, what are the, you know, how do, how do we preserve authenticity as uh, uh, like o over time? And, you know, it feels like most brands now are working with influencers. It's not like a, a you know, as, as new of a thing as it was a, a few years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I think like the word authenticity gets thrown around all the time associated with influencers. And I think there's real, like, there's not another word for it um, to, to replace it, but you really want to look for partners that, are have, have the same um you know brand ethos and same um like philosophies and thoughts as your brand because that is how synergies are going to form and that is how the content is going to remain authentic and so i think now more than ever consumers you know call out bs like they they know they know when somebody is slanging a product on instagram or TikTok and they they're not true to that product like it doesn't make sense like why why is this influencer you know talking about like these gummy bears like it doesn't make sense and so um you know especially on tiktok tiktok um people on tiktok are the first to like call out a brand when they see just you know inauthentic content and things like that and so i think as a brand um it's it's really important to do your research prior to make sure that you know, even if it's a small influencer with, you know, 10,000 followers, that every single influencer we work with at Lyft, I scroll through their content. I, I check to see the bigger influencers, you know, we go even deeper, but, you know, for micro influencers, I scroll through all of their content um, and 
for TikTokers, same thing. I make sure that there's no conflicts of interest, that there's, you know, they're not um, talking about another rideshare company or something that goes against our values at Lyft. Um, and then I, I, I think um, kind of going back to your point before, you know, creating content that is authentic to them. So, you know, if somebody is a comedian, you know, go to them with an idea that is going to be able to highlight their, their talent. If they're a photographer, you know, if they're a dancer, like whatever it is, um, make sure that whatever the ask is that you as a brand are, are coming to them with makes sense for their, their content and their feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of brands I think are, are trying to move pretty, pretty quickly, uh, you know, with, with TikTok and figuring out, um, you know, what is their content strategy there? And, and I think there is, like, like you said, there's some no-nos, right? Where like the TikTok community calls out things that they perceive to not be authentic. And I think that's part of like what is both attractive and scary uh, to a lot of marketers about TikTok is like, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, very often you go viral on TikTok, you're on that For You page. And uh, I've you know, heard, heard brands say that every part of their business sees a boom, not, not just like, um, you know, digital sales on, uh, you know, on TikTok or um, other social platforms, but across the board. So uh, kind of a lot of upside, but um, I think that perceived risk is really real. Like where TikTok's a little scarier that like people will jump on you if you, if you don't do it right. Yeah. Are there, um, like, I know you shared a couple of tips like to research, you know, the, the influencers and stuff, but what are, what are like when people jump on brands uh, about not being authentic, what is the what is the fallout of that? Is it just like lots of negative comments, or or does it go beyond that? Um, what is what should we look out for? Yeah, I mean, I think you know it can definitely turn into a PR nightmare as well, um, and so you have to be super careful about it. Um, you also have to you know prepare your influencers. So um, you know we just did um, a vaccine access campaign and in that, you know, there, there's a lot of people who don't believe in getting the vaccine and that's, you know, up to the general public, what they want to do, but we had to prepare the influencers that we partnered with who were pro vaccine, um, just in case they got trolled. Um, you know, we let them know like what Lyft's stance was like Lyft, you know, it says that it, it's up to you, but you know we are encouraging people to take a lift if they do choose on their own to get the vaccine. And so we just we had to prepare those influencers because it, it, there could be you know backlash from people that don't believe in that. And so I think um, you know just being aware of what could you know as a brand like that authenticity um, and preparing your influencers and making sure that they're equipped with, um, you know, knowledge is, is key. Yep. Nice. Um, and, and also part of like working with, you know, I mean, another thing that we're seeing uh, more of is brands promoting social causes. Uh, and I think that has been a little bit response to the pandemic, but also just the way the world's been going overall is people are purpose driven when, when they're making purchase decisions. Uh, and stuff. So a lot of authenticity, um, you know, that topic kind of blends into like brands being themselves too. Um, can you, can you also share some tips uh, you know, for, for how the best ways of promoting like social causes that the brand is behind? Yeah. You know, a lot of what we do at Lyft is, is really around our, our impact work um, and influencers and celebrities more than ever are really looking for meaning in what they talk about and the content that they, they talk about. I think a lot of influencers and celebrities would, you know, rather take less money and um, talk about something that like can truly like have impact on society versus taking, you know, more money for talking about like a product. Um, so, you know, at, like a lot, a lot of our campaigns center around our mission to provide transportation for all. So no matter your race, income, um, or zip code, we really want to make sure everybody has access to affordable transportation. And it really shouldn't be a barrier to, you know, get to your basic needs. Um, so a couple of campaigns I'd love to talk about. The first, um, a year ago, we did a partnership um, uh, with LeBron. And the um, background of this is growing up, LeBron loved riding his 
bike as as a kid. Um, it helped him, you know, you know, get to practices. Um, you know, it helped him like really like have opportunities. And so that was a passion point for him. And um, at Lyft, we own um, the one of the biggest bike shares, uh, the biggest bike share across um, the country. So City Bike in New York, for example, Bay Wheels um, in San Francisco. And so what we did with LeBron, we partnered with him and the YMCA in order to give city bike memberships to um, underprivileged youth. Um, and they were like 17, 18 year olds, so junior, seniors and high school. And um, we really told a story around that. And it was, it was super authentic to LeBron's narrative. Like before this partnership, there was, you know, articles about him and his passion for biking and things like that. Um, so we worked with him. We worked with um, a macro influencer named Nigel Sylvester, um, who is a um, BMXer, and he um, he helped he creates um, beautiful video content, and so he actually helped um, create the direction of what our piece of video content was that we put out into the world. He um, helped with that. Um, he also did his own content, and then we worked with about fifty um, micro influencers to help like tell their story. And um, it, it, you know, it, because there was this um, social impact message, um, people just loved being involved with it. And I think it was just like authentic to everybody that that was involved with it, which was really important. Um, Another example was we um, we did a really big campaign around voting. And so you're probably familiar, we had a national discount code that anybody could use to get to the polls. Um, and we also partnered with specific partners such as LeBron's More Than a Vote, John Legend, um, DaBaby, some other big names in order to really target specific communities um, that uh, we, we gave um, uh, free rides to the polls. And so again, like this was something like very impact related um, and it was authentic to everyone's stories. I know I mentioned John Legend before, but you know, he works with the formerly incarcerated communities. And so this was just, it, 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 it wasn't like we were asking him to do something that he wasn't passionate about, you know? And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I think uh, working, having an impact related message makes it um, a lot easier to identify partners who are passionate about that and that want to work with you because of that. Yeah. And what I think is so cool, both from a, a personal and a business perspective is it sounds like you take the time to get to know these celebrities and like what um, like their story and, it, you know, not telling their story, but the thing about LeBron that, you know, I, I didn't know that he, um, you know, saw almost his bicycle as like freedom uh, when, yeah. when he was younger. And like, that's what transportation to uh, like free transportation represents. So it, it sounds like you didn't really come to him with that story, but uh, you know, a bicycle, um, it, it, that, it's just really cool that um, you, you take that approach and you probably get to form more personal relationships with some of these celebrities than you would otherwise, if you're just giving them like a, a creative brief and telling them to get to work. Um, so. Exactly. But it goes, it goes back to authenticity. It's like, we, you know, we do our work on our end to do the research and figure out like who makes sense. Like, is this person going to be able to authentically tell our joint story together? Yep. Yeah, and I, I, I think that we've seen celebrities in marketing for, for a while and we will con continue to um, you know, into the future just because of the, the mass appeal and attention that they attract. Um, with regards to like smaller influencers who have less of a kind of just, just wide general audience, um, you know, that seems to be kind of a, a newer phenomenon that you know, it is becoming more and more mature. And, and we talked about some of the no-nos uh, to, to preserve authenticity. Um, what I think a lot about is like how do brands stay stay ahead of this like trend for like what's authentic now is probably not authentic a couple years from now. Um, like when we, we were talking before, we talked about how like uh, a couple like ten years ago, if a brand just had a Facebook account that was cool, authentic, they were looking more like a person, and um, you know now it's not that doesn't do much for you just to have an account there. Um, but w what do you think like how does this all evolve in like you know five years from now? What what are um, you know, what's this kind of micro influencer space going to look like? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's always going to be influence, you know, it, it, there always has been influence. I think um, 
there's different types of influencers and different types of influence. You know, I think now like LinkedIn has a huge influencer community and they, those influencers are so different than the influencers that you're seeing on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter. And so I think, um, you know, micro influencers, as we call them, they're, they're going to evolve to be different things. Like with the, with the evolution of new platforms, like clubhouse, for example. Um, and I know they talked about clubhouse in uh, the last session a little bit, um, I t- that I tuned in for, um, but you know, there are influencers bubbling up on that they're thought leaders and they're, you know, hosting rooms and they may not have, you know, thousands of followers on Instagram or on TikTok, but, you know, they're becoming these voices on Clubhouse. And so how do brands work with these people? And so I think, I think it's always evolving as the platforms and technology evolve. Yep. I I agree with you completely. And I I think, um, you know, to your point, they're going to keep evolving. Um, We at at Spaceback, part of our hypothesis is that uh, a lot of the the trends around social being such a, a, an amazing platform for, for content marketing. And most brands are now pretty social first when it comes to um, how they think about content marketing and, and talking to uh, you know, brand identity and building relationships. Um, it, you know, a lot of that does start on social these days. Uh, we think that, that a lot of these concepts are bigger than just the walled gardens. And uh, a lot of this kind of media can, uh, can, can power performance for brands, uh, you know, even in, in paid environments uh, or, or open market. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, are, are you, are there ways that, that you are getting more out of influencer content other than it just being posted on the influencer's handle? Or are there other, other ways that you're, you're getting that to market? Yeah. So, I mean, um, I always say this, like influencer marketing is, you know, a, a piece of the marketing pie. And like when it really works is when, marketing channels are firing on all cylinders. And, um, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, okay, should we um, run an influencer campaign around this? And I always ask them, well, what else are you doing to support whatever that is? Like, it shouldn't just be an influencer campaign. And so I think, um, you know, the, the perfect storm of influencer work is when paid is put behind it. Um, you know, influencers organically will post their channels, great we, you know, as a brand, we can repurpose our content on our channels. Okay. But where you really see the magic happening is when paid is put behind it, you're boosting, you know, the influencer posts, you're boosting, you know, the brand posts. Um, And so I think like that, that is where you see the most, um, you know, ROI from, from influencer work. Mm -hmm. That that's fascinating. And how do you know, like, what kind of, do you look at organic metrics to decide what to kind of put paid behind? Or um, is is it just everything that you're creating? You, you want to have some kind of paid behind or how does that campaign kind of planning process work? Yeah. So we we actually recently um, started testing this out. So um, we, you know, previously when we would have, you know, these big sort of celebrity driven campaigns, um, around our tentpole moments and, um, you know, longer form content was created, then we would put paid behind that. Um, but we, we recently, um, tested out, um, doing some, some paid across, um, TikTok with our influencer content. So I mentioned, um, a little bit earlier that we, we ran a vaccine access campaign and, um, you know, basically what we, um, what we did is we identified around 55, um, influencers on TikTok. And we worked with them in order um, to tell a story about getting their loved ones to their vaccine appointments. There's a new feature within, um, relatively new feature within Lyft um, called Rides for Others, where you're now able um, to call a ride for another person. And instead of um, when the Lyft driver arrives, instead of the Lyft driver seeing like your face in the app, they'll see the person that you called the ride for face. So it, it connects and, and it's, it's a pretty cool feature. Um, and so um, we, we worked with these um, TikTokers to, to help tell this story. Um, we took that content from TikTok and then we remixed it and um, turned it into some content that lived on our own channels across TikTok, Instagram, Reels, uh, Twitter, 
And um, then we put paid um, behind uh, a handful of the um, influencer TikTok posts, as well as um, we put paid behind our remix content. And so like that was how we spread it out. This was the first time that we've done something like this you know, robust with, with, with testing out, like boosting the content. So it's still actually like ongoing right now. So we don't have any like key metrics or, or reports back yet, but um, I have a hunch that it's performing very well. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's so fascinating to, to us is, you know, a, a lot of, you know, the traditional creative director says you have to create the right content for the, for the right platform. And um, that, that is like kind of what it, it's interesting. Some people uh, I've heard us say that's the authentic approach and other people are like, you know, the authentic approach is getting your best content in front of people where, wherever they are. Um, so I, it's almost like I, I can, I can understand both, both perspectives here. Um, but, but we definitely are seeing a ton of benefit on our platform too. when, when marketers use uh, high performing social content to power paid media. Um, yeah. One thing I just have to have to ask here is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you approach rights management? Um, you know, is that something that you think about upfront whenever you're working with, you know, any kind of creator uh, and do you ever get pushback there? Yeah, definitely. So typically we, we license content from the creators. Um, we don't own the content. Like when we, when I mentioned, we like remix the content, created our own, we own that, but um, the content that the um, creator made it, we, we license it essentially. Um, but yes, like it, we're always thinking about, you know, like the best way, the, um, you know, the most fair way to work with creators and work with their content. Um, you know, with TikTok, you know, obviously music plays such an important part in TikTok. And so that's been something like we haven't really exp experimented with yet um, because um, there's so many like licenses and things involved with that and then repurposing, you know, on our brand channels. So for this vaccine access campaign, for example, we, we said like no music. Um, I think in the future, like we want to test out, you know, we will license like a handful of songs um, and then see, you know, you know, look, the creator can can choose like what to use, but um, for this example, we we just said like voiceover, no music. Right. Yeah, that's a good point because in TikTok, the creators can select pretty much whatever they want, but that is uh, part of the TikTok partnership. So if you want to take that outside of TikTok, you don't necessarily like you might have rights to the content the creator made, but not necessarily to the audio. Did I understand that right? Yeah, exactly. And as a brand as well, you know. Yep. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then with with regards to uh, you know, like TikTok creators, are you finding that like are are creators these days like on any platform? Are there specific creators that like are you know these are TikTok, these are you know Instagram, these are Facebook? Um, like, do you have an idea of the platform that you want to work with, or is it more about the creator and then the platform is secondary? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it, I keep on referencing this campaign, but it's just so top of mind because we just did it. But, um, you know, with with this vaccine access campaign, we it, it was TikTok first. Like that's how we found the creators. The creators didn't necessarily have a big following on Instagram or the other platforms. And um, I think what's interesting about that and, and a challenge was that, you know, uh, in converting their content from TikTok, to Instagram, it didn't always like translate as well because they are, they're TikTok native creators. They're creating for their audience on TikTok and the audience on TikTok is different than the audience on Instagram. And so, you know, I think a big learning for me from this campaign is I want to, next time I want to have TikTok focused creators. I also want to have, you know, reels focused creators um, and so on. Um, and I think I think there can be creators that can can do it both, and I think there could be content that could translate for for both audiences. But um, you know, we're we're still like in the test and learn phase of you know who we are on TikTok and what that looks like. And so I think I think that you know I want to experiment in the future. So you know, to answer your question, um, I I think going with with what what the type of content is that you want, you know, for for this campaign, there were certain types of creators we wanted. Like we wanted creators that um, played uh, could play multiple characters, um, and so we found this um, 
a hilarious comedian named Ginny Lorenzo and she um, plays herself and then she plays her abuela and it her content like she she has I would say I think maybe like 200,000 followers on TikTok. She doesn't have like, you know, this macro following, but her content is so good and so funny. And we knew that she'd be able to like hit this out of the park, which she did. Um, so we were really like looking for that type of creator in this case. Yep. Yeah. And that, that's another thing that I, I um, thank you so much for, I, I feel like I'm learning a ton uh, for, from you right now. Um, so w- when you're, um, you know, working with a, a new influencer to or new, new creator um when when you think about the value that you pay, you're paying them for uh it sounds like you really value the content it's not just about the audience that they have on the platform and you know i'm sure that's part of it but um you know in this case it was like more about this person's going to write create the right content for us and they don't necessarily have the you know going to get the most eyeballs you know the other influencers could get you more more eyeballs perhaps but um really being content first which is i think one of the most ways to preserve, best ways to preserve authenticity too. Um, but how do you, do you kind of have a, is there a formula to place value on like, you know, reach versus content creation or is it always content first or, or how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, it used to be, you know, um, we, I would always try to balance like um, engagement rate and impressions because, you know, as as you know, the number of followers goes up, the engagement rate goes down. And so working with like a big celebrity, the engagement rate is not going to be as high, but you know, you may be able to get PR, whereas working with micro influencers, the engagement rate is going to be so much higher, but you're not going to be able to get, you know, any press around it necessarily. And I think now, you know, I'm super focused on what that content is and can we re, you know, how we can repurpose that content. Um, I don't own our social channels. I work very closely with the social team. Um, and so, you know, we're we're constantly thinking through like, you know, how the story we want to tell on our own channels and how we can, um, how I can, you know, figure out what celebrities and influencers would be best to help create that content. So I think like at this point, it's it, it it's really content driven. That's really good to hear too, um, because I, I do uh, I do think part of the um, distrust in influencers, uh, you know, or, or some of the distrust we're starting to see from from consumers is has to do with you know an influencer who has you know ninety percent of their following are are bots and you know it's kind of cooking numbers and, and less about content. Um, but I, I love hearing that content is is first and foremost like what what you care about and and also being mindful yeah. that that content can be. Um, you know, can, can be purpose-driven and can drive like your messaging uh, outside of social and, and on your own properties. Um, in terms of uh, paid media, um, are you using, when you talk about um, amplifying for, for paid or putting paid, uh, paid, paid spend behind um, content that's working, is that specifically on the platforms that it's created for? Or are you uh, using it for, for programmatic or, or other types of distribution? Great question. So currently it's on the platform. So um, on TikTok, on Instagram, we we haven't dabbled um, in using it in other ways yet, but I definitely could, you know, see us doing that in the future. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, you know, one one thing I see with uh, TikTok more and more with content being used in other platforms that I'm, it's a really little thing, but I'm fascinated by how TikTok puts the watermark um, on TikTok videos. And then uh, you know, I, I haven't seen like a download button on on Instagram or anything. The way that you can just download a video uh, from from TikTok, and it's almost like they're like what we were talking about earlier about these things being bigger than the walled gardens. It, it feels like TikTok's wall is not as high as as some of these other platforms, or at least they're um, they they are going to market understanding that TikToks are going to be outside of TikTok, and um, that that watermark to me is always fascinating because half the things I see on Reels sometimes. Has a TikTok watermark on it, right? Um, right. Do you think that's something we're going to see more of? Yeah, I mean, so yes, like I mean, I see you see TikToks all over Instagram, like in in feed posts, you see people posting TikTok videos. Um, yeah. But there is actually there's there are apps out there that can remove the watermark. So I I feel like I I wonder if TikTok is going to somehow 
you know, change that and make it so that there's no way that you can remove the watermark. I don't know, but, um, you know, it, it can be done. <laughs> there's hacks. <laughs> No, oh, int interesting. And, and the fact that they even let you have the content, even if there's a watermark right. in it, to, to me is hugely pushing the industry forward um, in, in terms of like, the you know, how brands think about being in the walled gardens. And uh, it's almost encouraging people to like, you know, I was, I was pumping gas the other day and that little screen uh, on, on my gas station was, uh, there were TikToks playing on that. And I don't know <laughs> the business behind or like what deals led, led that to happen. Wow. Um, but it, it was a head scratcher for me because I've never really seen wow. that. An Instagram carousel and those kind of situations. Yeah, like yeah, you're right. Yeah, um, and and I think even if that TikTok watermark wasn't there, what's kind of cool about TikTok, I totally don't would have known it was TikTok um, by exactly. by like the vertical. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, yeah it's very it's very distinct. It's very distinct. I mean, even when you like think of YouTube as well, you know, YouTube you can't like download the videos. Um, but YouTube is very distinct in the format where you probably, well, I don't know, maybe not. It's a good question to think about. TikTok is so distinct. Like, you know it when you see it. Yep. Yeah. And I think what, what's interesting about YouTube and like what we've looked at um, is brands seem to use it totally differently. Like some brands, it's like for fun, you know, some brands, it's instructional videos, some brands, it's influencers. And, you know, there's a huge spectrum of what YouTube is used for and TikTok. It's all fun. Like you, it, like you all can't. Fun. Yeah, you, you have to be fun on TikTok. And I do think it makes um, that the whole TikTok experience uh, a, a lot more like, you know, when TikToks come other places, I think all those fun signals are kind of brought along um, yeah. with the music. And, you know, there, there's just so, it, it just seems like so far, like kind of, it, it's all good vibes uh, yeah. over there. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that is retained over time. I agree. I think like as a brand, like how we're, we're looking at TikTok is that it's sort of like our playful experimental channel that, you know, we can have fun with, um, you know, our, um, uh, the person who is basically like the community manager of TikTok for us, she is really engaged with, um, you know, audiences making comments on, you know, posts that aren't ours and responding to people who are commenting on our posts. Like we we're really, you know, engaging in the community, um, but it, like you have to be, you have to be in, engaging with the community. We, we didn't launch our TikTok until um, right before Super Bowl and um, our launch was, we basically repurposed some of our old branded content um, called Undercover Lift, where we have um, celebrities and athletes drive for Lift and surprise their passengers. This was a content series that lives on YouTube. We repurposed some of the content, made it into um, TikTok format. And we, you know, went went hard right before Super Bowl. And we had um, two videos that we posted with Gronk driving for, for Lyft and Undercover Lyft. Perfect timing, um, which was really fun. And, um, you know, it, it was, it was playful. Like that was like what, what we had to do to make our entrance into TikTok and it worked really well. I think now we have like 70 or 80,000 80, followers on there. So it's growing. Wow. <laughs> and it's so relatable too. Like I can't imagine what would be more fun than, uh, you know, just, just trying to get from A to B and then having a, a <laughs> what John Legend pick me up or something. That, that's right? so cool. <laughs> yep. Um, I have a few questions from, from the audience, but uh, see, seeing you back, Ariel, I, I don't think I'm going to get to them. <laughs> no, totally. We could do a rapid fire. I mean, no one is after you, so totally. We can, we can take them. Cool. Okay, I'll, I'll just do a quick one because actually a couple different people asked this question when you talked about avoiding a P, PR nightmare um, when like that's, that's a risk. Um, what, how, how do you respond to a PR nightmare if, if that does come up, you know, in, in this kind of influencer category? Yeah. So um, I think, I think first and foremost, when, when you're ever you're doing campaigns with influencers, your PR team should know what's going on. And there, there should be um, an evaluation of like, you know, like risk. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think the, like this, your social team that you have like a CET team, like if you, if you can loop them in as well, um, just because they're going to be the front people that are, that are having to respond to this. Um, and so I think getting ahead of it can help like down the road. I, 
I think, <laughs> knock on wood, I've never, I've never had a PR nightmare with um, a celebrity or influencer partner. So thank God. Um, but you know, there, there has been stuff that has happened that could have, um, could have caused a nightmare. We partnered with, um, Demi Lovato a while ago, and then she relapsed and, um, you know, there was obviously separation between the partnerships and stuff in that time, but you never, you never know. Like, again, these people are human. Luckily, like nothing, came out of that nobody was like oh lift like you know you partnered with her and now Demi's on top of the world with you know her YouTube um video that's out uh movie that's out so I think yeah I think how to handle a PR nightmare I think getting ahead of it is the best way to handle it yep cool that's super helpful um Betty, thank you so much. Uh, I, I've yeah. done a lot of these and I feel like I, I learned a ton today. Um, it was a fun Good. conversation and uh, th this is gonna uh, be stuff that I think about uh, a lot more the rest of the week and, and moving forward. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was really fun. I enjoyed talking to you and um, uh, thank you for having us brand innovators. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both so much. This was such an amazing conversation.